Hey family, thank you for tuning into Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa. We're only the strongest roots see the light, brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please like this video, comment, share, and be sure to subscribe. How we doing, Phil? Hey, another weekend. I love it here, man. This is the pinnacle of my week, so glad to see you. Oh, man. Glad to see you losing some weight, brother. Feeling good, feeling good. It's a journey. I'm feeling healthy. I'm feeling right. You know what I'm saying? It's all about the babies. So, you know, uh, portion control and things like that, and, you know, you get some great results. So, you know, just uh, enjoying the enjoying the ride. Yep. So what are we talking about today? Ifa is Orisha. Orisha is Ifa. And the reason for this video is there's um, some misconceptions that are out there. And, you know, more than likely it's due to a lack of awareness about the overall structure of our spirituality. So what happens is, is when we talk about Ifa, it, it's very easy to focus on it as being the Babalawo part of the religion. When in reality, it is the whole religion and spirituality. Ifa actually makes reference to the oracular system that is the foundation of not only our spirituality, but the universe. Um, the oracle of Ifa was the first oracle. Um, and we're going to get into some of the opposing viewpoints and kind of, you know, show why this is the most coherent approach. Um, but when we look at Ifa, it makes reference to the oracular system, the binary code, right? Um, the 16 Mejis, etc. And they say that Ifa is nothing more than the voice of Olodumare. And I think the reason that it's known as that is because, you know, we as, you know, humans... If Olodumare did decide to say one word or syllable to us, we wouldn't be able to handle that. It reminds me of a movie that Ben Affleck did years ago with Matt Damon. Um, I think it was called Dogma. Oh, man, that movie is hidden from the world. You, can, you can't find it. I did not know that. I saw it as a young man on Comedy Central. Yeah, but there's, there's no versions where you can find a version of it now. Well, it's probably it's been gone. canceled, unfortunately, but it was a very impactful film. Even though they were able to, you know, kind of relate spirituality in a way that was comical and digestible, there were a couple concepts there that were very, very on point. And I think maybe one of the best films that those gentlemen has ever done. Chris Rock was great, by the way. Um, but he said, and you see at the very end um, when God speaks, and God was a woman kind of like how Ifa says, you know, um, the divine feminine and things like that. Um, when they heard audibly what God had to say, they exploded, you know, and it's kind of the same thing with this, you know, Ifa is so profound, Olo Dumari's voice um, has such a decibel count that if we were actually to listen, we wouldn't be able to handle it based on our physiology. But that's why the system was left in place and is so perfect um, scientifically, harmonically, um, so that it's in a way that we can understand it if we choose to study it and delve into it. So that's the first concept I want to make and understand and identify that clearly. So within IFA, um, you have two departments, right? And I'm going to go ahead and break them down more by position than necessarily, you know, um, Odisha. So the first department is that of Babalawu, right, or Ifa priests. These are the gentlemen that have been initiated into the mysteries of Orumila and Odu um, and who interact with the oracular system in its most purest form through the process of Dafa, which is where, or Alui King, or Olu King, where you are hitting the seeds and moving the seeds in a way to leave one or two of them left in your hand and be able to mark them on the tray, right? Thus coming up with one of the 256 combinations that composes this oracle. So what are the, um, the responsibilities of these gentlemen? Quite a few. Um, when we look at the Odu of Baba Ejobe, um, there was a story that speaks of when the Babalawos within the Lukumi tradition specifically, and this is still seen in Africa, but, you know, focusing on us, um, the Babalawos were able to do everything. You know, if they were initiated in Orisha, they could initiate people into that Orisha as Orisha priests. Um, they could perform Ifa duties as well, you know, whether it was the definition with Opele or, you know, Iking or any of these different things. And because of it, they kind of had a monopoly, on the spirituality and all of the economic gains that comes with it, to be frank with you. They were kind of like the Rockefellers mm. of, um, of Ifa. So, obviously, there's a lot of complaints that came, you know, a Sherman antitrust law. And the Olorisha, 
which are is the other department um, within this context, started complaining to Olo Dumari, saying, hey, we love our brother Bawalawos, but uh, we're dying of hunger over here because they do everything. They give the hand of Ifa, which is the first step that anyone should go through in the spirituality, period. Then right from there, they initiate them in the Orisha that they identify as compatible, right, through their method, being that they're the ones who should identify which Orisha is compatible, if you're going to ask the question at all. And then... They, you know, initiate them in Orisha, and if they're meant to become Babalawo, they do that too. So there's really not much space for us, you know, especially if they're initiated into the Orishas that they're initiating people into, which obviously was the case. So Lord Dumari looked at this and said, you know, not everybody's meant to be Awo, you know, like Ogun Nameji says. So let's make a little bit of a division here. Let's make some departments here. So he said, he stated from that point forward, he said, the Babalawos will perform functions that are particular to Orumila, right? If we look at Orumila, Orumila's process isn't conventionally done like the other Orishas, right? In the process of Yoko Orisha. His has to do with the process the Babalawos go through that the brothers are all aware of. Um, so he said, we will perform those functions under Orumila's scope. Ebo Pong, right, on the tray of Ifa, Opele divination, Iking divination, all of the responsibilities that we have within the Orisha process that do not interrupt the Olorisha capacity, right, depending on the house and how they choose to move forward, ethically or not. Um, all of the things, but we will not divine with uh, cowrie shells or the Erindi Logung method. We will not initiate people into any Orisha other than Orumila. Um, you know, and we will have a uh, respect of limitations, you know, and they say that it took seven years before the numbers can kind of equate and the Orisha community could recover to be able to kind of equalize things where till this day, there's less Babalawos than all Orisha because to be able to become Babalawo is a very particular, um, you know, set of attributes, right? So that's the first division. You have Babalawos, and then the other department is Olorisha, right? And this composes um, the vast majority of our practice, I would say, um, with men and women who are initiated into Orisha, whether it be Shango, Yemoja, Oshung, etc. And they perform all of the rites that have to go within that. Uh, Kauri divination, sacrifice, initiation into various deities, some that the Babalawos can give, some that cannot. I'm not referring to priesthood rights. I'm talking about icons um, because the Babalawos still has rights to certain deities such as a Gungung, um, Osain, at least within the Lukumi context, right? Within Isheshe, it's much more open where a Babalawo who is initiated in Oshung, even being initiated in Itelodu or Itefa, etc., Ifa, Ibodu, he can still initiate people into said Orisha. For example, I'm initiated into Oshung, but being that I went into the rites of Ifa, I can no longer initiate people into Oshung. Thank God for my wife, though, because she can. Mm. Um, but, you know, they have the department of Orisha or Oriate as well, who's the master of ceremonies, which is a very complex position that involves years of study and dedication and aptitude to be able to perform. Um, where even Orumila ceded a lot of those rights to the Oriate or Abore Orisha, as he's known, that's identified in the Odu Baba Gundameji and Isheshe as well. He was a son of Obatala or initiator of Obatala, I believe. But in the Odu of Osala Fobeo was actually where the Babalawo gave the rights of, um, you know, certain implements like the scissors and the razor blade to be able to perform functions um, within, within the room of Orisha. Because he was becoming so inundated with Ifa work that he didn't have time to do that. So originally, um, Oriates used to train with Babalawos in, in antiquity. Once the Baal, In Africa, definitely. But in Cuba, the Olorisha arrived a little bit before the Awo. But when the Babalawo got there, a lot of the brother Oriates, you know, they were in the Oluo's house learning, you know, which was most conventional. Because when you look at the context of our faith, all of the ceremonies of Orisha are born in Odu of Ifa. And we'll get into some of them now. But um, the Odu of Salafobeo is a prime example of that, where, you know, they learned everything from Babalawos because we were the ones who had the secrets. Uh, you know, ergo our name, Babalawo, father of the secret or father of that which cannot be seen. So what happened was there was a huge division that occurred, um, even more so than what happened divinely in the Odu of Eyobe, 
um, there were a couple of things that kind of caused a cre- or created a schism within our faith. And, and there was two very large ones, you know, that are really unfortunate. One of them was greed. Um, some of the old Babalawos, you know, it's different culture, different time. They were a little bit tyrannical and money has an effect on certain people sometimes that isn't desirable. So they started abusing their position a little bit. And because of it, um, it caused people to not contract them where they were charging exorbitant amounts to be able to perform processes like, um, you know, the initial reading before Orisha initiation or the famous matansa or sacrifice that's carried out Mm. within Orisha initiation. And um, that caused us to kind of be, you know, benched as a way of saying it. And then another one was homophobia. Right, being that Ifa is a heterosexual fraternity um, of men who do not come into trance in the conventional spiritist egungung sense, um, some of them, you know, unfortunately had a lot of character flaws and mistreated a lot of our brothers and sisters who represent, uh, you know, a huge demographic within Orisha practice. And, you know, without them, you know, I don't know if our religion would still be here, to be frank with you, because Orisha, before the Babalawos and other individuals arrived in Cuba, um, was carried on the backs of this demographic. So, you know, it's it's to be recognized. And that's why there's Odu such as Owani Woche and um, Ogunda Kete and Otru Bonsa that speak of the importance of respecting the equality of people regardless of orientation. But neither here nor there, once, you know, certain people started realizing, okay, they're overcharging us, they're discriminating against us, well, this is what we're going to do now, because if I'm the one bringing the prosperity to you, and I'm contracting you to perform a function for me, I expect to be respected and, you know, uh, recognized. So how about this, Oluo? Um, You're going to stay home. We're not going to interact with you. We're not (laughs) going to call you to anything. Our God kids, even though we have Hand of Ifa, because there's a bunch of advocates for not receiving Hand of Ifa that have received... The majority of the Oriates that I noticed, they're like, no, you don't need your hand of Ifa until you're old and dying or Orula is just a poder. They all have hand of Ifa, but rather than sending people to the Oluo's house, they'd rather pull out the guardian angel with the shell and change guardian angels and do a bunch of things that, you know, we won't get too into. But um, what happened was, and this happened around like the 50s, uh, right before, you know, Ifa started really getting to this country. Um, they left the Babalao at the house. So he didn't do the Matanza no more. People weren't receiving Mano Orula. Um, you know, registro entrada, things like that, divinations and whatnot, were completely eliminated and taken over by the brother Oriade. Some who may have wanted to do that anyway, some who probably were like, I don't want to do it, but I'm getting paid for it. You know, there's worse things, supposedly. And just like that, we have this huge divide to the point where Ifa at that point was seen as a completely different religion, Mm. where it is to be reminded of and restated right now that Ifa is the religion. It is the umbrella. And under it, you have the, you know, I guess the handle or whatnot. On one side of the handle, you have Bawalawo. And on the other side of the handle, you have Iworo, right? Or Olorisha. And it's just that simple. To the point where you could still see remnants of certain things. You know, the Erindilogun oracle is so complex. Um, is it as complex as Ifa? Not in the conventional sense or not at face value. You know, where within Orisha you have a singular throw of one letter, not a double letter. There is no Obeche in the Erindilogun. There is no Ochesa. There is no Metanla, Merinla. There is none of that. There is a singular Odu, right? Um, and concepts like that can be found in the Odu Iretekana. Because when they did divination for Bawaluaye in the Odu of Iretekana, the number 13 was revealed and he said, I don't need any more information after that. I'm leaving you guys anyway. And that's why the number 13 within the Edindi Logung Oracle marks the difference, right? Because after or including the number 13 and beyond, it's not that the brother Abore cannot finish the divination. It's just that once you get done with the recommendations of Orisha, at that point, it is understood that ultimately the next time the person gets read, it needs to be with a priest of Ifa, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But it is such a complex oracle, um, you know, even though it has a a singular throw compared to Ifa having the double leg, um, you know, there's really no need to discuss Ifa literature or Esefa in an Erindilogun divination. There's more than enough information if you're around, you know, credible and experienced and versed 
you know, priests that you won't ever have to speak a story of Ifa within, you know, the Odisha context. But what we see now being that Ifa came over much more completely than the Erindi Logun Oracle did to Cuba, you see now this really, you know, unproductive practice of the brother Oriates or, you know, even sister Oriates now, like Osala Fobeo states that the woman can throw the Erindi Logun, um, speaking stories of Ifa in a cowrie shell reading. And really incoherent because that second letter that they throw, which I identify as a ghost throw, being that Ibo or the two implements to identify Irero Sobo have not been dispersed, doesn't exist. It's not, it's, it's as if, you know, it was an accident and it fell on the shell and we wrote it down anyway. This originally or supposedly was a way to preserve Ifa, um, which is greatly appreciated, but I mean, there has to be at least 50,000 Bawalaos in this country, you know, I would imagine, or maybe a little bit less, I don't know, but I'd, I'd be surprised if there's less than 15,000 in Miami alone. Um, and then you couple New York, I mean, there's about allow anywhere you want there to be at this point, especially with travel and the information age. Now, finding one that you actually feel is competent and you want to work with, that's a little more tedious, but they're out there. There's some good brothers out there, just like there's excellent brother Odia is. But it's easy to see that one is not the other, but they both fall under that same umbrella, you know, and there, there's so many Odus and Patakis that really touch on this, you know, specifically about the uh, Erindi Logun Oracle before we get into other themes. Um, you look at, I remember one time I was having a conversation with a brother Odiate and he, um, he asked me this very indiscreet question. He said, um, you know, what came first, the King or, you know, the Logun? And, you know, I calmly responded. I said, Iking, right? And he went into this, uh, you know, dissertation about metaphysics and biology and how the ocean was around before earth and, you know, shells were around before vegetation and seeds and all of these different things. And, you know, I'm sitting there, you know, I think we were at a, I think it was actually a drumming or a cajon or something like that. And I was, I was posted up in the cut like I usually am. And he went on and on and on for a good five to eight minutes, and I didn't say anything. He was a pretty passionate guy about his his ideas. And once he finished, I, I'm not sure if he expected a response from me or not, but I definitely had one. He was kind of taken aback by it. And my response was that in the Odu of Babao Yakung Meji, it speaks of when Ela first manifested. There's a very similar pataki in Ofum Meji as well as Ikafa or Ikaoshe. And it speaks of when the seeds of Iking were planted in heaven and the roots descended upon earth. Similar concept in the Odu of Baba Gunda Meji as well. And they started falling from heaven to earth. The same way when we're doing a divination, when we're pulling, the seeds are coming down and back and forth. Um, and it says that they descended upon earth, right? But the ironic part about Oyekun Meji is it is the oldest sign historically and from an age standpoint within the whole religion, whole spirituality, whole oracle system. And it does not speak of the Erindi Logun anywhere. Mm. So you think if this guy was the first guy ever and he's writing down what he saw and what manifested, if the shells came before Iking, why are they not mentioned in the oldest scripture we have in our whole spirituality? Ironically, it does have a pataki that speaks of the tools of Orisha. For example, Ogun, being that he's open, we can speak about this. The various tools that, you know, the, the pickaxe, the machete, etc. It speaks of those. Where even the tools of Orisha were present before the cowrie shell was utilized and manifested as an oracle system. So that was the first point I brought up to him, right? Um, and then he mentioned, you know, the Odu Babao Shemeji, which speaks of when the Arindi Logun was cast on the mat for the first time. And Oshun had a sick son. His father was Orumila, but couldn't initiate him into Orisha because of what happened in Ayobe. They went to see his aunt Yemaya, her husband Shango through the shell, etc. All these different concepts. And, you know, I reiterated to him, Oyekun Meji was around before Babao Shemeji. And then apart from that, I also cited the Pataki from the Odu Baba Irete Gudan or Irete Kedda. Where, you know, Owo Ero Merindi Logun, or Owo Eo, depending on how you say it, um, had 16 sons. And unfortunately, he passed away unexpectedly, and his sons were orphans. Mm. So they went to the house of Orumila to be able to learn how to make a living for themselves because their father never taught them 
the same art that Orumela had taught their father, which was how to speak in divine. In the Odio of Irete Gutang was where Orumela was the one who taught the father of the shells how to speak, you know, the famous opening of the back of the shell. Um, so when they visited him, because Orumila was the only guy that they trusted, look at that, right? First 16 priests of Orisha, the man they loved the most after their father was a Bawala, it was Orula. Yeah. Um, and they went and divination was performed for them. And Irete Ogunda was revealed where Ifa said, I can't handle all, six, all 16 of you at once. It's too much for me. But I have 16 sons who are prepared and will initiate each of you. And we'll teach you what they know, and then you'll reiterate that, and they'll become your spiritual father, right? And each of the shells went to a different Meji's house. So the Odiobo Kanrang went to the house of Babao Kanrang Meji. Ejioko went to Babao Yeku Meji. Ogunda, Ogunda, Iroso, Iroso, etc., etc. And they learned how to speak and to be able to divine, where you're going to find a lot of similarities between the Meji of Ifa and the singular Odu of Erindi Logun. But it will never be the same because... You know, for example, my father speaks wonderfully, but he speaks very differently than me. But I speak very similar to him. I will never speak the same as my father. The same way the shell will never speak the same as Ifa. But in the Odu of Irete Gudang was where the shells themselves went to receive hand of Ifa. And apart from that, when they showed aptitude, Irete Gudang, who was their godfather ultimately, initiated them into the rites of Abore Orisha and consecrated their hands to be able to allow them to real, realize an Ita and facilitate the Orisha process. So if we're looking at things as profound and as, you know, uh, old as this, I don't understand what the debate was. And the ironic part that I told that brother at that moment was like, if the shells were around before Iking, which represent the Mejis of Ifa in the story, why did the Iking have to teach the shells how to speak? They would have known how to speak, and it would have been the other way around. What was his reaction? He paused, and he looked at me because he asked me the question in front of a, a group of people. Um, he's a notable guy. We'll say no names, of course. And, um, you know, I, we are what we are. And, um, he kind of paused and he looked at me and he kind of switched it up. He was like, man, what a blessing Two people that study you guys. You're so lucky to be in our presence. And, you know, I'm looking at this guy. I'm like, that's awesome, man. I, I, I don't fully agree with what you're saying, but you know, he, he switched it up a little bit because you know, the facts are the facts. I, I have no, I have no predisposition. I did not become a Babalawo to say I'm above anybody. You know, in reality, when you enter into this slavery, because Ifa is a spiritual slavery, where the Olorishas, you know, are kings and queens, the Babalawo is a slave. We are Eru, right? We are slaves. Um, but Ifa and Orumila stated in Eyobe, it is better to be the slave of God than the king of man. So, you know, we understand what we get involved in, you know, and we're kings in our own right, but we live a life of servitude and slavery to humanity to help, you know, whether they have it or not, you know, within reason. Um, so, you know, that that's kind of, we ended up actually sharing a drink together and, you know, we went our ways and we've never seen each other again. Um, but, you know, I was, he was able to somewhat defend his position. I was able to fully defend mine based on scripture. That's the big thing when it comes to Ifan Orisha right now. There's a lot of talk about, you know, traditions and all these other things, it's not a tradition unless he first stated it in an Odu first. To be able to create tradition, there has to be trajectory. And trajectory comes from what was left to us before from a scientific, spiritual standpoint through these scriptures and this binary code. So, you know, when you hear people say, no, this is how it's done in my house, this is what was taught to me, so I do it this way, that's okay as long as Orumela said it first. And it's able to be corroborated by SFA. If not, then we need to reevaluate. Now, we're not talking about minute things, whether you put a white candle or a red candle. At the end of the day, there's a candle. Mm -hmm. But it does come down to, did you offer this animal or not? Did you take them through this preliminary process or not? Um, and that leads us into a great segue as well, because the whole process of Orisha initiation, whether... It is in Cuba, Lukumi, or it is in Isheshe, Nigeria, wherever is all in Odu of Ifa. So you'll hear some people say, well, the Babalawo that is not initiated in Orisha cannot enter into said room of Orisha. Let's say they're crowning a Shango, but let's say I have a godson who washed Ogun and he doesn't crown Ogun, but he's a Babalawo, he can't go in the room. That's erroneous, regardless of what anybody says, because if you, are, if you do not have the credentials to be in a room, why does your license stipulate all of the information that is being exchanged and 
put into action in that room if you're not able to experience it or enact it. When we look at any of the various stories of Orumila, when he worked Orisha ceremony, it never said that he had Orisha done. He was a babalawo. So maybe some of them did, maybe some of them didn't. For example, when you go to Nigeria, and you know, that's a that's a big thing now. No, in Nigeria, the Bawalaos aren't anywhere in the Orisha process. That's rubbish. Because if we're talking about like, let's say you're in Oshobo, right? And everybody, you know, is initiated in Oshun, whether they have Ifa done or not. You're going to tell me that one of the brothers that's in there, ironically, isn't a Bawalao when the whole community is initiated in the same deity. Or, for example, you know, because the Yorubas are some of the most hospitable people you'll ever meet. A Bawalao comes and he's there. And let's say they're crowning a Shango and he's an Oshun priest. They're not going to let him in the room. If he's a chief and all these different things, they're going to disrespect the man like they disrespected Bernardo Rojas, you know, back in the 50s. I don't see that happening, you know. And, and it was through that interaction with Bernardo, who, from what I understand, even though being a very strict man was a very decent man and very knowledgeable, they didn't let him in the Orisha room one time because they said that he wasn't initiated in Orisha. And, um, you know, he made a stipulation there, and this is hearsay, of course, I wasn't there. But he made a stipulation from that point forward that anybody that wanted to do Ifa, being that he was the elder of Cuba at that point, anybody that wanted to do Ifa had to do Orisha beforehand to avoid any of those kind of conversations or innuendos whatsoever. So it, it's been a long time coming in a lot of things. But if you look at all of the key pieces and parts of the Orisha process, all of them are found in an Oddu. You know, Oddu's like Irete Suka, my own. Uh, in the Odu of Eyobe was where the Ita of Orisha first manifested the Ita of Orisha Imaginate. so you know all of these different things how can you know we say that one is a religion and the other is not part of it or vice versa we are all under the same umbrella totally so so I'm going to ask you a really dumb question here no such thing um, you're saying all Orisha Yes. Correct, not just Orisha. Correct. Okay, I was confused. So the word Olo means owner. Like, for example, Olokun means owner of the ocean, which is Okun. Um, you know, Olorin means a singer, but when you break it down, it means Olorin or owner of the song, right? Um, and then Olorisha makes reference to Olorisha, owner of Orisha, right? And to be able to be an owner of Orisha... You have to have gone through the you have to have gone through the Orisha ceremonial process of crowning or idosu as it's known, um, and that's really where at least the division within ours comes in, um, because like I said in Ayobe, the Baalaos were even me. I'm technically both, but you know I focus more on Ifa. Ifa limits me to itself, so therefore I identify more as Awo or Baalawo, etc. But it doesn't take away from the fact of what I had beforehand. It's not that it's erased or anything like that. Um, but when you look at processes like the Odisha process, right? Like one of the most polemic themes now is whether, you know, the Bawalawo should perform the uh, sacrifice of Odisha or not, right? Um, originally, when we talk about certain concepts within Ifa and Odisha, some of them seemingly have been innovated due to social interactions rather than scripture, right? So when you look at the Babalawo and his credentials, we go through a ceremony known as uh, Obeka Kwanadu, right? Or Obeka Panadu, um, which means, you know, the knife and, you know, things like that. We basically receive the knife. Um, the ceremonial knife, we're inducted at that point into a society known as Obalogun, right? Um, or the kings who were the children of Ogun or the, the gentlemen who, you know, had the knives and things like that. And um, it's a ceremonial rite where it gives us the right to sacrifice on uh, quite a scale, right? But it has more profound connotations from an Ifa standpoint, but that's somewhat of a basic gist of it, right? So based on that interpretation, it was pretty, you know, understood, like, you know, we let these guys sacrifice. They have a knife, right? They have a ceremonial process for that. It doesn't mean that the Olorisha cannot sacrifice four-legged animals. For example, if there's a brother Oriade who has received Elegua and had his Ita of Elegua and, you know, I don't have an issue with that brother, you know, sacrificing that goat, opening that goat. Um, you know, I mean, 
I, and then it becomes even more debatable because when you read the Odu Babai Kameji, the only Orisha that ever danced the head was Orumila. So the only thing I might be a little obtuse about is if, you know, brother, you don't have to dance the head because that's not an obligation for you. Some people see the things that the Babalawos do as privileges. Um, it, really, they're, they're nothing more than speed bumps and impositions. For example, the Oshebile prayer to be able to throw the coconut. People are like, oh, how come you guys get to throw it and we don't? Well, to be frank with you, we would rather not throw it because after you say it the 10,000th time, you'd rather not say it at all, you know? And when you begin to understand what Ochebile says, and it was an imposition placed upon the Bawalawos by the coconut because the Bawalawo had a natural frust or the coconut had a natural frustration with the Bawalawo because he was the one always breaking his head open, the famous letter Itawa was revealed, where Ifa says, well, you know, ask again, you know? So that's why we pray Ochebile. Um, but it's not a privilege by any means. It's an imposition, you know, making it that much more strenuous and us having to work twice as hard to be able to get the same results. So things like dancing the head and whatnot, you know, there's no scripture that speaks of when anyone other than Orumila did it. And if we're interpreting Ifa, Orumila, you know, was synonymous with his sons and his initiates. So if I was a brother Oriade and I was sacrificing a four-legged animal, I'm like, all right, yeah, I don't have to dance the head. Here's the head. Lick it. Do whatever you're going to do and put it on the Orisha. When you look at the Odu of Obeyono, you know, where the, uh, the animal parts were first presented and whatnot, you know, it speaks of when Yemaya took the meat of the goat and spread it out and fed everybody and saved the world with it. So those are things I don't have an issue with. Like you have some brothers... Um, you know, that, that base themselves on the Odu Babao Sameji, where they said anybody that's not a Babalawo shouldn't be opening the animal. Mm, how come? Well, they say that there's a spirituality that lives within it known as the Iamio Shoronga, right? And what protects the Creole Lukumi Babalawo from these energies is the process we go through in the Kwanadu. Now, mind you, I would say that's a little bit more applicable within the Orisha process, right? But at the same time, I have to be a devil's advocate and say, well, if the intestines were so taboo, you look at some of the oldest, you know, um, and the reason I'm able to talk about this is because in the Dia de Medio or the, the middle day, you know, people are invited into the room to salute the new Yawo and things like that, whether, you know, you're initiated or not. The curtain is up, you know, it's a moment of recognition and the aches are there. So a lot of the older ramas used to do something called the trenzas where they would get almost like chitlin style. They mm. would get the, uh, the intestine, clean it out completely and do braids with it and leave it on top of the aches, right? Well, it's true. They're not opening the animal, but you're still interacting with the part where the Iamio Shoronga live. And the Bawalaos weren't doing that. The old school Santeras were doing that and they were monsters at it. So, you know, in the Orisha context, I would understand why it's more sensible or maybe more convenient for the Babalawo to perform the sacrifice. But let's say there's a brother Oriate and a client comes and the client's like, yo, I want to give a ram to Shango, but I want the meat, but this, that, and the third. I don't necessarily have a problem with that brother doing that yeah. because, I mean, he's initiated in Shango. He at least has the icon, I'm sure. Um, you know, I mean, all those old Santeras who did the trenzas, they live to be a hundred years old. I mean, I don't have a problem with them doing that, you know, even privately to be frank with you. I'm at a stage in my career where nothing really bothers me outside of my house. If that, so let's say a brother Oriate wanted to do the Matanza Borisha because, you know, unfortunately it's a house where, you know, Babalawos are not welcome. I mean, is he going to die from it? I can't say that because a lot of the old school guys did it and nothing happened. But as long as they understand the ramifications of what is occurring or what could happen, I mean, for a brother to actually delve into that and do it, he has to be uber prepared and understand what should be done and what shouldn't be done, you know. But when you look at Odus like Oyekumbe Dura or Ogunda Irete or Ogunda Gede, you know, and that sign was where they didn't invite Orumila to perform the sacrifice in Orisha. Right. Um, because they didn't want to pay him. You know, they thought his uh, his rate was unreasonable, which it wasn't. They just didn't want to invite him because they didn't want to say Boruboya. Mm. Um, but they invited Ogun because Ogun was the constructor of the knife. Ogun is not the owner of the knife. The owner of the knife was Obadala and it was gifted to Orumila for saving his son Talabi in the Odubabao Sameji. But Ogun was the constructor. So he wasn't necessarily versed with it in a way 
that was constructive. He knew how to build it, but using it, he was a little bit indiscreet. You know, he was kind of sloppy. So when they do the Odisha process, and there's a certain step that happens where Ogun kind of lost his mind. He actually became so energetically stimulated that he came into trance, and he accidentally killed everybody in the room. He blacked out, you know. So when the slaughter happened, and ironically, the only person that survived was the Iawo, being that they were sitting or kneeling, um, Olodumare looked down and he saw the bloodbath. He said, I thought we were going to crown the first Odisha effort, and all I've seen is like, a, you know, a massacre. And Ogun, when he came out of trance, he was like, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. But all of the Santeros were dead. And Olodumare immediately called upon Orumila and said, you know, why didn't you show up? Why didn't you, you know, why didn't you fulfill your role? And he said, they asked me for a quote. I gave them a number. I thought it was reasonable. You know, I, I know people that are charging much more. Um, and they said they were going to call me, and they never called me. So I, I didn't know this was even happening. Mm. And from that day, Olodumari said that to be able to perform the sacrifice of Orisha, you cannot come into trance. And that's why the Babalawos cannot come into trance, you know, because no matter how revved up I get, no matter how spiritually, you know, stimulated I get, I'm still going to be Joseph the whole time. I'm not going to turn into Oshun or Tahose or anybody like that. I'm here, just like the brothers. Um, and he said, it should be you because there's so much energy in that room. And then the witches were there too. And they wanted to eat the blood of all the dead people. And Orula was like, I could have prevented this, but I didn't know. So if you don't invite me, I mean, the, my hands are clean, you know. Um, so that's the thing here. It really doesn't come down to what's right or what's not. It really comes down to what's productive. And, you know, at, at that moment, in that case, Orumila was the most productive option and he wasn't sought out because, you know, for whatever reasons, whether it was frustration, whether it was money, whatever it may be. But, you know, he was he was the most coherent option there and it, it just didn't materialize that way. Okay. Interesting. So I was on the channel. I was look. I, I can't find out what video this was. It's an old video. Someone says, "What happens if someone touches your elekes? Elekes. Someone uh, else touches it." I mean, it's you know. I, I don't know. I don't want people touching my wedding ring. You know what I'm saying? So it's something that's intimate to me. It's something that belongs to me. It's in a very personal space. It's on my neck. Um, spiritually, these are certain items that you don't want being you know overstimulated by people that aren't you. For example. Erica can touch everything I own. She owns everything I own. <laughs> she owns you? She, no. <laughs> she, I am hers and she is mine. There's no doubt about it. So, um, But it's like, for example, you wouldn't just go into somebody's house and go into their soperas and start, you know, messing with their orishas. Um, I, would, I would go as far. If the person doesn't know, I would say, hey, man, that's just, forgive me, that's, um, you know, that might be ignorance. That might be, you know, we're not aware um, but if somebody knows, it might be even misconstrued as a little bit disrespectful because you're invading somebody's personal space and then you're touching something that's very intrinsic of them, you know, and it's something that picks up energy. So, for example, I don't know what you were doing with your hands five minutes before. I don't know what intentions you have for me if you're trying to become that close to me. Yeah. Um, it's something that probably can get very easily misconstrued. And I've never actually seen that happen. I've never seen anybody just run up on somebody and, you know, touch their alekes. Even people's godparents, like, that's just, I don't know, that that, that just that doesn't happen, you know. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to ask that. I saw that on one of the videos a while ago, uh, old video, but. Yeah, so, I mean, when you look at even the story of Ogun or, you know, other things, like, you know, it's just you begin to realize that we, we both play a role in, in each other's processes, you know, and, and it, it really is where you cannot perform any fine initiation without, an initiative of Orisha, usually the woman um, that, you know, attends to the table or some of the people that might be auxiliary outside might have Orisha done or their hand of Ifa. Um, even though they don't go in the room, that doesn't take away from the part that happens outside. I mean, for the brothers that know the complexities of an Ifa or an Itefa, they know that just as much is going on outside as, in it, as, it, as inside. So, you know, all those people play a huge role, and without them, nothing's possible. I mean, put it this way, you can't, and, you know, this is an even greater point. Um, someone does go into the room. You know, when we talk about the apete biayafa, ultimately she goes into the room of ifa under certain conditions that are quite different than when initiation is going on. But ultimately, you know, they penetrate in a way where they're there. You know what I'm saying? 
Um, so we can't finish without that. And usually, you know, uh, Balao's wife or the, the mother or whoever's doing that is initiated in Orisha. So, cause that's a huge argument. Well, you know, you don't let us in your room. You can't come in ours. Well, ironically, you do go in just under very different conditions. For example, usually as a Balao, even though I have the ability to be in the room through the whole Orisha process, I usually won't go in cause you know, I love giving people space. I like my space. Um, unless I have that real fraternal relationship, like with the Oriates that we do work with, I might be outside or I might show up at a certain time when I know the first half is done. Just, you know, you know, just give space and let, let the brother Oriate breathe and do his thing. You know what I'm saying? Because no one likes to feel like they're being supervised. And the Odu Odikana says that the Babalawo has to respect the Abore Orisha's words within the room of Orisha because he spent more time learning that than us. Even though we have all the information, we might not have interacted with it in a way as, as profoundly mm -hmm. as he has. So we're there as a support system. The same way, you know, we need to be supported when we're doing an Ifa. And then you look also at the concepts of, uh, you know, with the matanza again, or the sacrifice of Orisha. You know, they say in Africa, yeah, the Babalawo doesn't do the matanza. Well, here's the thing. I guarantee you that one of the people sacrificing there is a Babalao. Even though it's not seen as a prerequisite, it is seen as coherent and it is seen as convenient. You're going to tell me in the land of Oshobo with all the people initiated in Orishas and the mountainous amount of Bawalaos that there's not going to be one Bawalao there sacrificing. We're always there. Mm -hmm. The Odio Salafobeo says it. No Orisha process has ever happened successfully before, during, or after without the shadow of Orumila being there. And I tell you this, whether the Bawalao is doing the Matanza or not, I notice when it's like, you know, no Bawalaos, no green and yellow, keep it moving. Things don't end well there. You know, um, either there's a separation that happens after Odisha, things go upside down during the Odisha process, there's huge obstacles. I'm not saying it's all the cases, but the majority of cases that I've seen within our tradition, and I'm talking about now since I was eight, I mean, 24, 25 years, I noticed that things don't go as harmoniously as when they do. Now, this also depends on the character and quality of brothers that are working as well. You know, we're there to perform a job. We're not there to be, you know, drinking a certain amount of alcohol before, during, and after the matanza. We're not there to impose ourselves. We're not there to walk in and not say hello to people. We're not there to walk in with black sunglasses trying to look like Anuel. You know, like, there, there has to be a certain level of humility and decorum that, uh, you know, is going to allow us to be accepted the same way, you know, someone who's conventional, whether they're about allow or not, wants somebody to enter into their home, especially if they're being contracted, which is what caused this issue 50, 60, 70 years ago to begin with, um, to the point now where we're like, are we the same religion? Are we not? And we definitely are. We're just different departments, you know, but we have a certain level of fluidity within both sides. I mean, whether Bawalawo or even Brother Oriate or Lorisha, you know, uh, I have to take somebody. I mean, I'm just blessed that the woman who crowns the Orishas lives in my home. But if I wasn't married to an Orisha, and let's say my wife only had hand of Ifa, Hey, um, you know, let, let's build some relationships. Let's see who we can trust our, our children or God children with, you know, let's build that trust. For example, if um, Botanica Candles and More or this podcast, we don't perform my own initiation in any way, shape or form. We've built relationships with people that are competent and trustworthy and do a great job and are very talented. Like it's been to the point where this was such a non-issue. I've been tarrayamientos for god kids or people that i know even the rayamiento that happened when i had the conversation i did with the brother oriate it was a cajon for a rayamiento that had happened i think the day before that was the day they were coming out it's been like five years i don't know but they invited me in the room you know during ceremony and process and i told them i'm not scratched and they said no you're about allowed you can see everything and i said no we can't you know that's not that's a whole different religion Ifan Orisha, and that's how you know what I'm saying is coherent because Ifan Orisha, same religion. I'll go in that room, no problem. But when we're talking about, you know, my brother Abacuas or the Quinongos or the Paleros, and like, you know, they'll let you in. But, you know, me personally, I don't feel comfortable doing that because I haven't gone through the process to be welcomed there socially or more importantly, spiritually. Just because you're a Baalao, and these are things that you see in Cuba, but, you know, for example, a Baalao from Nigeria, let's say Lagos, can't go to Angola into the jungle of Mayombe and just walk into a Kimba. You know what I'm saying? Like, just because you're a Baalao, they don't see none of that. Where it became more understood was in Cuba, right? And even then, I respect it because 
the same way I don't go into the room of, you know, or the Munanso or Mfamba or whichever one, I want the Bodu respected. You know what I'm saying? Just because, you know, it, 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 that's how it should be. If you have the credentials, please. I can't go into an operating room unless I have my MD or, you know, board certified or what have you. So it's just about courtesy, understanding, pedigree, and being, you know, practical and productive because all these other things are going to continue to disintegrate our faith and we're going to go nowhere fast and we're going to fall apart. And without unity, you know, we're, if we can't understand ourselves, no one's going to understand us. So... Yeah, I get it. I, I also see in the comments, too, um, when we do our live shows, is that people ask about Mayombe or um, Valero and all that. What was the question? I, I'm just saying I notice people talk about Mayombe in the comments a lot if we if we do with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful religion. It's not one that I had the opportunity to uh, to get initiated into. I'll, I'll, I'll share that a little bit. I remember when I went through my uh, my misas of investigation or my misa de investigación, which are processes that are done before Orisha um, initiation, even though it's not conventionally far or traditionally far, it helps um, because, you know, you have deities that don't necessarily identify with this spirituality, but they have something to say as well. I remember when it was the debate whether I was going to get sworn out and also hopped into Palo, it was like, I think the last Misa before the last, the, the, the Misa before the last one, before the, you know, the, the big one that mm -hmm. everybody knows. And um, I remember I was sitting there and the woman that I was supposed to get scratched in her prenda or in her house or what have you, whatever the specifics were, um, she actually, you know, asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, you know, I'm very interested in Palo. And I, well, I was going to crown Ochun right after that. I was in Cuba for that. Um and she looked at me and my mom as well. And mind you, these are two American people in a country that has a lot of needs. And we went with funds. Um, and she said no. And, you know, the reason she said no is because she said she had a conversation with my muerto, where my muerto actually was initiated in both of those uh, traditions and um, died tragically because of it. And she said, I won't bring you in because your muerto says if I bring you into this and you ultimately hop into the leopards you are going to end up the same way, if not worse, right? And if you do these things, you're not going to fulfill your destiny with any fa and affect the people you're meant to. Um, now, mind you, this is now nine, ten years ago when I did Oshun. This lady had that much foresight. This is before channel. This is before Ifa was a real possibility to me. I always wanted to do it, but I didn't feel like I'd ever achieve it, you know, the imposter syndrome. So, yeah. you know, this lady had so much you know, illumination and wherewithal to be like, let me not interrupt these people, you know, with all the economic she gained, she gained, she could have garnered there. Um, nothing short of ethical, ethical and just a, a complete woman and lady in all senses of the word. God bless her wherever she is. Um, but that, you know, ultimately guided my path and whatnot. But that's why I personally didn't get scratched because um, the opportunity was there and it didn't happen. Um, all of my children are scratched, but they don't necessarily practice from an initiatory standpoint, like bringing people in. So that means that, you know, you have to outsource. I, I saw a brother online recently say, if you don't know how to do something, pay somebody that knows how to do it to teach you and do it for you until you learn how to do it. Mm. And, you know, I think now we're at such a stage, maybe economically people are so strained and they're either trying to save or make a dollar or there's such a lack of humility due to the information age, making people think that you can be an an overnight success overnight. It took 30 years for this channel to become an overnight success. You know, it's taken Phil, the podcast doctor's whole life to become an overnight success. It right. took me one night. It took me 30, my whole life to become an overnight success because a lot of people don't realize all of the investment and time and energy and sweat, blood and turmoil that it takes to be able to form an individual within the spirituality. And that's why it's so important for us to move harmoniously because you could literally stunt somebody's growth or interrupt their destiny, or really destroy their lives if you allow your ego and your interests to interrupt their needs. There's a story that I want to bring things full circle with that I haven't shared on this uh, platform before. And it's from the Odu Obeyono, or Obesuru, right? And there's this really interesting concept that happens now that some people have that I couldn't agree less with um, about how... Orumila has nothing to do with the cowrie shells whatsoever. Um, but this 
sign as well as the pataki I'm going to relate um, completely refutes that. And in the Odu of Obeyono was where Orumila married Orisha Aje. You know, we've said the pataki before, the first part, um, where she was known as Iaile Iwo, which was the mother of the land of Iwo, and that's where the term Iawo comes from, and it's known as bride, right? She was Orumila's, I mean, based on the story, she was his first wife. He married money first. Uh, smart guy. Um, but there was the famous story of where she tried his patience, like she had all her suitors beforehand, and Orumila was told by Ifa and this Odu to have suru or patience to be able to achieve, um, you know, or Iwapele to be able to achieve patience or patience to achieve Iwapele, better said. And it got to the point where she defecated on top of his mother's grave just to get rid of him, you know. And um, at that moment, he wanted to kill her, but um, he had patience. And he said, you know, that's okay. We'll clean it up. And when she did that and she realized that this was the best man she had ever interacted with, she quickly realized she needed to be on his good side because no other man was going to tolerate what she had just done to him in his mother's tomb. So she immediately apologized. She embraced him. They kissed, etc. cetera. Um, he was still courting her, but she said, I'm going to marry you because you have the best character of any man I've ever interacted with. And I am going to turn all of this defecation and throw up and, you know, material and refuse that I've left upon your mother's hallowed ground into money. And it all became cowrie shells and resources and things like that. But she went even a step further. She said, if anyone ever wants to interact with the cowrie shell, they have to go through you first. Because Ajay means shell. And she is the one who disperses the shells, which are actually the property of Olokung, her father, that she has been seen as the administrator of. And when Orumila married her, she had so much confidence in him that she said, make my life easier. I just want to spoil you, but you let me know who you think deserves to be spoiled. So when we look at the concepts, like in the Odu Oye Kunda, where Orumila gifted the shell to Oshun to be able to divine, um, or Obeyono, where, you know, Aje gave Orumila the posterity to be able to decide who received the cowrie shell and not, you begin to realize that without Orumila, no one would have a cowrie shell. Orumila was the one who gifted the cowrie shells to the various orishas. Now, mind you, there are patakis that say Obatala had it first, Obesa speaks of it, um, Osarosun, but Obeyono was first. Obeyono was there before them. Um, and Orumila gifted the cowrie shells to the orishas as they proved themselves and showed aptitude. And, and it wasn't just money. It was the divination method, Right. So you begin to realize that without your hand of Ifa, without Orumila, it's to the point where Orumila lives right next to Ajay or vice versa, and Orumila should live on a bed of cowrie shells, even though in the Odu Obetwa, he didn't utilize it anymore as a divination method. But he still dispersed it for those who needed and wanted it. That's why to be able to arrive at the room of Orisha, the person should have their hand of Ifa first because it is through that process that Orisha receives them. Ajay recognizes them and says, I am willing to respond to you because my husband has identified you as somebody that is worth talking to. Mm. So just based off of that information, we are inseparable. We are family. We are kin. We are a clan. And as we proceed into the future, if we continuously publicly cause dissension no one is ever going to want to unite with us it has to begin from within joining forces right um to be able to create the example that is going to confirm people's desire to want to be in orisha and ifa because people want to be down with us they want in you know they're like we want all of that we want all parts of that but if they see us arguing or they see us giving these you know viewpoints that are completely opposed they're never going to do it. I mean, there's things I don't necessarily agree with as a Baalau, but I have been able to get to the point in my career where I'm like, that's debatable. There's certain things that aren't debatable, but, you know, if you want to do that, brother or sister, and, you you know, it's it's not hurting nobody, and you're still, you know, spreading the cheer, hey, man, whatever is more convenient or whatever is more um, conventional or productive, but know what you're doing. Study. Don't ignore the information that's there just to be able to further an agenda that you know isn't productive or helpful to anyone.
That's that's the biggest message here. And understanding that Ifa and Orisha are nothing more than just Ifa with two different departments mm. is the ultimate message. So Yeah, that makes sense. It's big, big thing, but there's different departments. That's all it is. It's just Walmart. <laughs> I think we got some shout outs, don't we? Of course we Give it do. To me. All right. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you drop a like. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe. But this time, let's show a spotlight to the people that show love to the channel by joining our membership program. There are three different tiers, and each tier offers its different perks. So let's get started with the super fans. Give it to me. We got Dr. Nakia Brown. Get him, doctor. We got Ruben. Ruben. We got Gaines, Tennessee. Oh, big Gaines. We got Shannon Torres. Love it. And let's hit a shout out to the VIPs here. We got OG Richard Massey. OG. We got Divine Destiny Healing. Thank you. We got Idalise Amanda. Very nice. And Elizabeth. Let's God bless you guys. We yeah. love you guys. You are the best part of the channel. If you're not in there, get in there. Tap on the link. We have some great exclusive content in there. A couple closing thoughts before we go ahead and disconnect. Well, Tiny Got Candles and More.com is up and running. For all services and material needs, we do ship. If you're unable to catch the podcast sometimes here on YouTube, be sure to check out the podcast um, from an audio standpoint so you can listen while you're driving, right? Please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Big thank you from all of us, guys. And until next time, see the light.